It's now my pleasure to introduce the first panel on the four pillars of hotspot policing. And before I introduce the panel, I just want to make a quick remark that I think applies to both hotspot policing and the idea of evidence-based work. I was at a conference recently, um, and it was a national conference and national presenters. And there was a presenter that was presenting and talking about the impact of law enforcement um, on communities of color, and particularly the negative impact over history that law enforcement has had on communities of color. And, you know, talked about the role of law enforcement enforcing slavery, talked about the role of law enforcement in enforcing segregation, and then transitioned into uh, more modern issues in law enforcement and how law enforcement has negatively impacted communities of color. And at one point, the speaker mentioned hotspot policing is one of the examples that the speaker was giving of how law enforcement was negatively impacting communities of color. And right away, my defenses went up. And you know, my first impulse is, my God, they're attacking our work at DCJS. We promote hotspot policing. That's one of the pillars of the GIVE program. You know, now you're telling me that that oppresses communities? And then I took a breath after a few minutes and said, all right, stop being defensive, try and listen constructively and think about what's being said. And as I did that, I realized that the details and the examples that were being given about how hotspot policing in this speaker's view was negatively impacting communities of color had to do with examples of hotspot policing that didn't match with the concepts of hotspot policing that we encourage. And it made me think that, you know, it's not enough to say, hey, we do hotspot policing. Because there are ways to do hotspot policing that do have very negative effects on communities and community relations. And there's other ways to do hotspot policing that can be very positive and it can bring community and law enforcement together and have very positive effects. And how do we know if we say we're doing hotspot policing, that we're doing it in a way that's constructive or we're doing it in a way that's destructive? And I think that's the value of having presentations like this today, to again come together and think about, okay, it's not enough to say we do hotspot policing, but how are we identifying those hotspots? What are we doing in those hotspots? When are we doing it? How often are we doing it? How are we measuring what we're doing? All of those different things that go into being able to say not, I do hotspot policing, but knowing that we do it in a way that's constructive, that's helping, that's building relationships. And I think that there's no one better than the next panel that we have here um, to really share with us some of the knowledge about how hotspot policing can be done in a way that's very helpful to communities, that can bring law enforcement communities together in a very beneficial way. So with that, I'm gonna briefly introduce our presenters. Um, again, as Chuck said, their full bios are in the materials. I won't read them all because I don't wanna cut into their time. Um, but first we have with us Cynthia Lum, professor of criminology at George Mason University and the director for the Center for Evidence-Based Crime Policy. One of the things that um, always jumps out at me is Cynthia certainly comes to us now with a tremendous academic background and a great research background and incredible credentials that you can read about. But she started as a street police officer in Baltimore, working in some of the toughest neighborhoods that you can get. So she's seen these issues from many different perspectives. And I think that certainly um, lends to um, both the weight that she brings to the topic here and, and you know, what she brings to us in terms of understanding the impact of what we do. Second, we have Chris Coper, also from George Mason University and principal fellow at George Mason's Center for Evidence-Based Crime Policy. And again, you can read in the bio, Chris has done tremendous research over the course of 30 years um, in the criminal justice field. Chris and Cynthia recently just um, co-authored a book I'm going to make sure I get it right here. Um, Evidence-based policing matrix, or no, I'm sorry. Um, 
Criminology and Public Policy, um, a book co-authored by Cynthia Lum and Chris Coper, um, Evidence-Based Policing, Translating Research into Practice. We also have with us on the panel Detective Sergeant Joseph Rotigliano from the City of Newburgh Police Department. Um, Detective Rotigliano um, has been with the City of Newburgh Police Department since July of 2003. He's been assigned to many different specialized units, um, but has played a huge role in the work that Newburgh has done, both with their focused deterrence effort, with the non-fatal shooting work that they've done, um, work that has really significantly reduced the number of shootings that they have in Newburgh every year. And then finally, we have Dr. Claire White on our panel. Dr. White completed her PhD at Arizona State University, um, and again, has done some very incredible research and work in the criminal justice field. Um, we're honored to have her with us. Um, I think the other thing that I note is that she is currently at the University of Wyoming. Being a Bills fan and knowing that that's the home of Josh Allen, I'm very happy that she could be with us today as well. All right, a few other Bills fans here, I like it. But in all seriousness, to all of our panel members, thank you very much for being with us here today and for sharing your expertise. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Cynthia Alum from George Mason University. Uh, before we begin, I just wanted to take 20 seconds of Are your you time. Are going to embarrass me? Just slightly. Uh, but I just wanted to take 20 seconds to say <coughs> that um, the center gives out two of the biggest awards in evidence-based crime policy. One is the Distinguished Achievement Award in evidence-based crime policy, and the second is the Hall of Fame uh, for police uh, uh, personnel and uh, on evidence-based policing. And um, this year, Commissioner Green was the winner of this, uh, the Distinguished Achievement Award of Evidence-Based Crime Policy. And I wanted to recognize and congratulate him in front of your colleagues, uh, because many of you were not at the DC uh, Symposium. So Commissioner Green, congratulations. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. you did very well. <laughs> I think it really speaks to not just the commissioner's work, but really the progressive nature of the state of New York. And um, I can assure you that the state was so well represented in DC this summer. And uh, I hope to see some of you um, at the symposium next year. Okay, um, I I'm just gonna begin. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing the four pillars of place-based policing. And uh, you've already heard uh, who our panelists are. But the topic today is so important to the dual mandates of the police, um, you know, in particular to detect, deter, prevent, reduce crime, but also to gain the trust and confidence of communities. And places, and more specifically micro places, so these are homes, these are storefronts, these are um, street corners, blocks, alleyways, these are places where people's routines and activity spaces coincide with the social and physical environments to create opportunities for all sorts of things, both legal and illegal. Places are really a central focus of uh, an evidence-based approach. The traditional approach in law enforcement, however, has pretty much been focused on individuals, frankly. Um, individuals rather than on people inside of these places. So to open this session, we're going to have Professor Coper lay out the basic principles of the four pillars. And by the way, for those of you, please get a little bit comfortable. If you need to turn your chairs now, um, uh, please do so, because I think this, this is some good stuff that you're about to hear. But Professor Coper is going to lay out the four principles of a place-based approach. Then Professor White is going to drive home the importance of a place-based approach informed by her work in Baltimore City. Crime, of course, can be the cause or the result of many other problems at places, including mental, physical, and community health issues. The police are often the first line of defense, and they are also the first line of advocacy uh, for places and figuring out the mechanisms that keep these same places for years and years hot in crime and low in resources, I think is really important to understanding and breaking that cycle. And then Sergeant Rotigliano is going to bring us home uh, with his experience in Newburgh City 
on place-focused policing. One of the biggest challenges in policing is really sustaining this type of approach, changing tactics of officers, building internal systems in the police to successfully achieve crime prevention approaches, as well as trust and confidence with citizens. And, and I think the commissioner said it perfectly. Hotspots policing is not about necessarily the where, although that's the first step, of course, but it's really about the how. The tactics that police choose to implement at a particular place can be wide ranging. It could have varying consequences. And so targeting hotspots, in my view, really requires a very surgical, a very intellectual, a very tactical and operational approach that can be sustained. So hopefully that'll help set up this um, panel for all of you. And I'll first invite Professor Coper up to speak on the pillars of hotspots policing. Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. So as Cynthia mentioned, I'd like to begin today's panel with just a brief discussion of what we like to call the pillars of hotspots policing. These are the key central elements that we think are necessary to doing hotspots policing well and using it as a means to reduce crime at hotspots and to also try to strengthen police community relations at these locations. Now I'll start by giving a little bit of background about hotspots policing in general. Hotspots policing refers to police interventions and activities focused on small areas or very specific places where crime is concentrated. Now there's no universally accepted definition of the term hotspot, but it's typically used by researchers and police to refer to very specific addresses, intersections, street blocks, and clusters of blocks where crime is concentrated. And hotspots policing is grounded in research showing that typically about half of a jurisdiction's crime occurs at 5% or less of the street segments in that jurisdiction. This is a very common pattern that has been found in a multitude of different jurisdictions, urban, suburban, and rural, here in the U.S., also abroad. It is pretty much a universal pattern that we see. Another thing that's notable is that many of these hotspot locations are stable over time. So you often have chronic problem locations that year in and year out cause a lot of your crime problems. These locations are often nodes for various business, leisure, and travel activities. They are places where people cluster in the course of their everyday activities, bringing offenders into contact with potential victims in a variety of ways. They also have various social and environmental features that contribute to criminal opportunities at these places. In short, these locations are problematic due to various aspects of the activities and routines that happen at these places, which create opportunities for predatory offending, as well as opportunities for various types of disputes to erupt. They're also problematic because of the actors who frequent these locations. They can be problematic because of environmental conditions at the locations. This could in include things like bad lighting, abandoned buildings or lots, areas of blocked visibility, uh, roadways that provide easy access in and out for drug markets and the like. And finally, they can also be problematic because of a lack of proper guardianship or control over the locations and the people at these locations. And that can be due to the nature of the location. Sometimes it can be due to negligence by parties who otherwise could exercise better social control, people like place managers and business owners. For police, there are a lot of advantages to focusing on crime hotspots. For one thing, you're concentrating your attention on the places where crime is most likely to occur. Officers can also generate a more visible presence and have a greater perceptual impact in the small space of a hotspot as compared to over larger areas. And by focusing on these very specific locations, it may be easier to identify and to change some of the underlying conditions that contribute to problems at those locations using different problem solving techniques. So police have the potential to reduce crime through very targeted efforts with a hotspots approach. We also have a great deal of research indicating that hotspots policing is effective. There have been dozens of studies done over the last few decades evaluating different types of police interventions focused on hotspots. 
including things like directed patrol, targeted enforcement, problem solving, and other interventions. And in the vast majority of these studies, researchers find that the police have been effective in reducing at least some targeted crime types in those locations. And studies suggest that when you target hotspots, you often reduce crime within the hotspots and often even in areas immediately surrounding the hotspot, what we refer to as a diffusion of crime control benefits. Many studies have also looked at crime displacement, and they generally find that hotspots policing does not simply displace crime to other areas nearby. Many studies find no indications of displacement. When indications of displacement are found, they usually tend to be less than the crime prevention gains that you get from targeting the hotspots. So we have a robust body of evidence to support hotspots policing. So having said that, well, are police doing hotspots policing? Are they doing it well? We find in practice that many agencies are doing some variation of hotspots policing, but they're not necessarily doing it in the most effective ways. In many agencies, hotspots efforts can be largely ad hoc or unsystematic. So for example, hotspots operations may only be done temporarily or every now and then. Even the everyday efforts to target hotspots might be largely informal and unsystematic. So for example, they may not be guided by good crime analysis, or the dosages and activities may be less than optimal. The efforts may not be properly tracked or managed. And so for these reasons, uh, Cynthia and I developed what we like to call the four pillars of hotspots policing based on the research evidence to help agencies improve their practice of hotspots policing. Uh, we discuss these in our book, uh, Evidence-Based Policing, and I'll briefly go through them here. And they include geographic analysis of micro places and trends, reorienting everyday patrol operations around micro hotspots, using problem solving at these locations, and also trying to engage the community uh, at these locations. Now, hotspots policing begins with good crime analysis, but analysts need to drill down and emphasize and identify the micro places that are most problematic in the jurisdiction. In other words, getting at those particular addresses, intersections, street blocks, and clusters of blocks that are most problematic. And they also need to put more emphasis on long-term patterns. So in some agencies, this might require some adjustment because oftentimes, Crime analysis reports that are used, particularly in management meetings, often still tend to emphasize short-term patterns, short-term changes in larger areas like patrol districts. So this requires a little bit more of focus and a little bit more of a long-term perspective. We also encourage analysts to track problem places over time and to build institutional records on these places, their problems, and the interventions that they've received. What we find is that police agencies in general are very good at tracking cases and tracking individuals and keeping records on them, but they don't typically track problem places. And so they miss an opportunity to capture institutional knowledge about these places that exists among their officers. And this is an idea that I'll return to also in a few moments. The second pillar involves the use of regular patrol at crime hotspots and indeed trying to reorient everyday patrol around these micro locations. So officers in general are accustomed to thinking of larger areas, patrol areas and patrol beats, but we need to encourage them to focus on the smaller places within their beats that generate the most problems and indeed to perhaps make those the anchor points of their everyday patrol efforts. Now, for example, one way to do this that seems to maximize both efficiency and effectiveness is to have officers make periodic stops of about 10 to 15 minutes at these locations, uh, one or preferably more than one time throughout their shifts. This idea is based on research that I did uh, earlier in my career indicating that when police stop at a hot spot for 10 to 15 minutes, they have a greater deterrent effect on crime and disorder than they do by simply driving through the location. But at the same time, staying longer than 15 minutes doesn't necessarily bring greater benefits. Uh, this strategy is sometimes referred to as the Coper Curve strategy based on a, uh, a figure that I had uh, in my original article, and it's uh, shown on this slide here. But the point is that this is a very easy uh, guideline for police to follow in their everyday operations, and it can be helpful, particularly for everyday patrolling around these locations. Obviously, there are times when officers need to stay at hotspots longer 
for important community engagement or problem solving activities, but in terms of everyday patrol, making the rounds, just checking on these locations, this can be a particularly effective uh, and efficient way to do that. The third pillar involves applying problem-oriented policing to crime hotspots. As I'm sure all of you know, problem-oriented policing is a philosophy that stresses analyzing and addressing underlying conditions that contribute to repetitive crime and disorder incidents in the community using both enforcement approaches as well as non-enforcement prevention-oriented approaches that are often implemented in collaboration with other government and community partners. And the research indicates that hotspots policing is generally effective when it's implemented well. And it can be particularly effective in the context of hotspots policing. So problem solving can be implemented by an agency in a variety of ways. They can have area patrol officers do this. Uh, they could be assisted by specialists in crime prevention and problem solving. Crime analysts can also be involved in this as well. In the context of hotspots, policing problem solving means studying the particular features and conditions that are contributing to crime at different hotspots and developing solutions that are tailored to the specific problems in those locations. Interventions, uh, problem solving interventions conducted at hotspots might include a wider range of different strategies like situational crime prevention measures, nuisance abatement and code enforcement, targeted surveillance and enforcement, securing abandoned buildings, and the like. And what the research suggests is that hotspots policing strategies that have a problem-solving component tend to be more effective than strategies that just rely on patrol and enforcement alone. Now, to help facilitate problem-solving at hotspots, uh, Cynthia and I have developed an idea that we like to call the case of place strategy that we also discuss in our book. And the idea here is to open investigative case files on problem places and assign officers or perhaps even detectives to thoroughly investigate these locations and identify the range of actors, social conditions, and environmental conditions that contribute to crime at these places. This then feeds into the development and implementation of responses at those places, which should of course be documented and assessed for effectiveness. All of this in turn creates the institutional record that you like to have on problem places that can be used for further tracking and assessment, as I alluded to earlier. Uh, for agencies interested in this, we've actually developed a case of place tool that is available on the website of the Center for Evidence-Based Crime Policy. And essentially, it is a problem-solving guide for uh, hotspots. And indeed, at this conference in prior years, we've heard from some different jurisdictions that have used this type of approach uh, to try to deal with problem places. The fourth pillar then is to emphasize community policing principles that stress engagement with residents, workers, and community leaders in hotspots in various ways. So use those regular daily patrol visits to connect with the people there, to solicit their views about problems in the location, and to use those opportunities uh, as a way to better understand the features, the routines, the people, and the problems of the location. It's also an opportunity to talk with people in the hotspot about things that the police are doing to try to address problems in the hotspots and to solicit their feedback on those activities and to seek their collaboration in problem-solving activities. In general, we know that these sorts of community policing approaches are effective in improving police community relations. So in this context with hotspots policing, it can help police to develop the social capital and cooperation in these places that they need to effectively address hotspots. So those in brief are the four key pillars, but in concluding, I also just want to note the importance of managerial practices and systems that are necessary to support hotspots policing. This starts with more formal identification and analysis of problem places, as I've mentioned. It also includes developing more formal guidance for officers on what to do there and more formal tracking and evaluation of everyday police activities at those locations. This also means establishing the organizational systems that are necessary for this. So for example, are hotspots activities being tracked through the CAD system or other organizational systems? 
are these locations discussed regularly at management meetings? Are hotspots efforts included in performance reviews and the like? So these are some of the important questions that agencies need to think about when they're formulating, implementing, and trying to institutionalize hotspots policing strategies. So in closing, those are our recommendations grounded in the scientific evidence for how we think police can be more proactive, more targeted, more systematic, and more effective in their efforts to reduce crime and also to strengthen police community relationships by managing problem places. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, next we have Professor Claire White. Well, I do not have slides, <laughs> so um, I will just be talking about some of the research that I have been doing for the last uh, several years. So I, before moving to Wyoming, where there's very few people and, and crime is quite minimal, um, I was out in Baltimore collecting data on 450 street segments. So we talk about these micro places, these, these small areas that have um, a lot of concentration on crime, of crime. And while it's well established that crime is highly concentrated in these, these micro places, and we've started to develop um, strong research on some of the land use and the, the physical characteristics of these places, we don't know a lot about the people um, that live in these places and what their, their lives are like. And from a um, law enforcement side or a practitioner side, those, those stories and that information can be very helpful in how uh, we interact with people in the community. So in, the, in this study, we uh, collected um, over 3,000 surveys across uh, 450 street segments for three different waves of data collection and started to notice a lot of patterns in terms of the, the lack of social cohesion among neighbors and residents in these places, um, a lack of willingness to intervene, and uh, a large focus of the study was on health and mental health and the disparities that we saw in residents living in crime hotspots compared to residents that did not live on crime hotspots across the board in um, diagnosed illnesses like asthma, high blood pressure, uh, lung disease, arthritis, and my particular interest on uh, mental illnesses, PTSD and depression. And when we think about what that means for the ability for a community or a street segment to come together and um, work with the police to prevent crime on their own, those types of factors can be um, debilitating in their ability to work together. So not only did they have health problems at higher rates, we also saw that the impact that those health problems had on their daily, the ability to complete daily activities like walking down the street, carrying my groceries, bending down, those types of um, activities were limited among uh, people living in hotspots and impacted their life much more. So when we developed a pilot program, off, kind of an offshoot of this larger program, that partnered mental health professionals with police officers to actually go to these crime hotspots. Uh, much of the research on responding to mental health problems has come um, from the program of crisis intervention teams and those are really kind of the, the best practices we're, we're seeing in terms of police officers having more training on symptoms of mil, mental illness, on how on de establishing partnerships with uh, health providers as well as um, uh, uh, clinicians that can actually understand kind of the, the health side of the, the problems. And they, this team of a pro, pro, excuse me, police officer and clinician went to hotspots and just knocked on doors and said, we're doing this new program, we'd like to uh, see if there's any, anything you need in terms of health. And people opened up, right? We were very apprehensive doing this in Baltimore, whether people would be willing to talk to the police, this was shortly after um, the, the death of Freddie Gray and the, the riots, and even the police were very apprehensive that people would be open to talking about their health problems and their need for services. And we found quite the opposite. 
And most programs have been this reactive. A crisis occurs, there's a mental health issue that uh, occurs, and we need to, to respond. And they follow up. They may follow up with the individual. Uh, but as, as Cynthia noted, a lot of, this, a lot of those programs are still individual focused. And when we take a place-based approach, we can start to think about how these people with health problems are concentrated in the same places with crime problems. And we can go to those places and try and connect people to services, try and build those relationships so that law enforcement and the community can work together. If, you're, if these crime hotspots are with people that are, have mental health problems and are apprehensive to call the police, they don't trust their neighbors, you're, there's this environment where that partnership breaks down. And as you know, as law enforcement agents and practitioners, you need that community partner. And so as we move forward in understanding hotspot policing, we need to recognize the different types of people that live in these areas and the disadvantages they may, that may limit their ability to be an active partner when working with the, um, with the police. I, did, I, was, okay. I was more leaving it towards questions. Yep. No, so that's I okay. will wrap up there. Thank and, you, Claire. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, the, <laughs> let me just say that we've asked the presenters to spend just a short period of time speaking so that we could have more time for questioning. And um, so as you think about your questions, we have two mics on each side. Uh, and we might just go straight into questioning. And I, I could start off a little bit, but we'll go straight into the questioning from the audience. Um, our next speaker is Sergeant Joe Ritigliano from Newburgh City Police Department. And he's going to talk a little bit about his experience in implementing place-based approaches. Joe. Good afternoon, everyone. Let's see my slides here. All right, cool. So we've had great success in the city of Newburgh with hotspot policing. Um, before Give, everybody remembers what happened before Give, right? We were an impact. Does everybody remember impact? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Couple. Um, with the evolution of Give, uh, everything became more data driven, right? So we were starting to look at our hotspots, but actually focus on more of the people at the hotspots that were making those, that were putting the dots on the map, so to speak. Uh, we used this strategy along with some of our other strategies and we were able to drop our gun violence drastically. We had a peak in 2015 of 55 bullet to body shootings, as you can see. And in 2018, we were able to bring that down to eight. So, and a big part of that was targeting the hot spots or those micro places, because as you'll see, I'll show you some slides. So that's what our shootings looked like in 2015. Now, we're back up to 15. We are effectively addressing our micro places and we're targeting the right individuals. But as I'm sure most of you know, when you have a substantial drop in crime and you target the right individuals, what happens? More people get out, there's a realignment in the groups, and now you have to kind of not panic, but look pragmatically at the situation and take time to look at who your offenders are, um, and why do they keep going back to these same places? Because our hotspots have shifted a little bit, or our, our shootings have shifted a little bit, but you'll see that our long-term hotspots, there's still a lot of overlap there between our long-term give hotspots and where we're seeing our bullet-to-body shootings. But as, they, as uh, Professor Coper was saying, uh, we used community engagement at our hotspots so we would have weekly meetings to determine where the crime was. And in addition to having foot posts there and proactive details there, we would make sure that we did community barbecues. We would try to get some community engagement uh, as sort of a litmus for, for what we were doing to make sure that they saw that we were offering some positive return. We weren't just going there and writing tickets for everybody that, was, that had an open container. Uh, we want to target you know, that, that 5% of the, per, of the population or the 15% of the population that's committing 5% of the crime. And I think when you move into a data-driven approach, I think you're able to have a lot better results. And, and I mean, 
like I said, if you go from 55 shootings to eight in a couple of years, then it looks like you have the right guys. So here's overlapping slides that'll show the yellow is 2015 and the red is where we are at currently. So those are our give zone and long-term hotspot target areas. And again, I went through evidence-based policing last year and a lot of the stuff that we were kind of already doing in Newburgh, uh, now I realize there's names for it. You know, there's a coper curve, which we would stop it. We have patrol plans that are set up at our hotspots. And, you know, now being able to go back to the department and tell a couple patrol sergeants, hey, listen, you know, there's a sign, there, it's proven that if you stop at these hotspots sporadically throughout the day unannounced, that you're actually gonna deter crime and probably lower your calls for service for that day. Um, a couple looked at me like I was crazy, but a couple guys actually did bite. Now, if you look at our shootings now, we're all still in those, those hotspots, right? And in those hotspots are micro places. Most of them are corner stores. Um, they also have a fair amount of vacant homes in them too. But, you know, when you start looking at like case of places and other strategies that um, Cynthia and Chris talk about in evidence-based policing, you have to start looking at what are your, what is the draw to those locations? And a lot of our crime stems around street drug dealing. And when we do have gun violence, which we're, you know, we're seeing an uptick now, a lot of it is based on group conflict. Um, right now, it looks like for us, it may be intergroup conflict, but we need to sit down and, you know, gather intel, look at our data, and then try to find out, well, who's arguing with who and what are we doing here? But we still haven't solved the problem of why, like why First and Carpenter? Why South Lander and Renwick? If you look at, you know, a place like First and Carpenter for us in the city of Newburgh, it's a, a great place to go buy drugs if you're from out of town because there is, as Professor Coper said, there's an easy egress that will take you right through one of our parks and right out of town into the town of Newburgh and then you're on an interstate and you can be on Interstate 84 in under three minutes. So those are approaches that we're gonna have to start looking at if we can't get to the group conflict. So what else here? One thing that the patrol division did also to tackle hotspots is we put patrol plans in place. The patrol lieutenant has patrol plans that are in place in our hotspots and either a patrol officer or a patrol sergeant during the tour, if they have time, if call volume allows, they'll stop at the patrol plan, they'll make a call to CAD or to put it in the CAD that they're out at a patrol plan and then they'll call off when they're ready. So that way the crime analyst that has that information and we can use that along with our crime mapping to see is there any, are we having a deterrent effect by having people get out on these corners, interact with the community, or just be a present in these hot spots? And we've had, like I said, we've had great success. The biggest problem that we're having is that uh, the city of Newburgh is a young department. We've had a lot of turnover. Uh, whether it be through officers retiring or moving on to better paying jobs. It's hard for us to institutionalize this program. And, and you really, it's super important that if you want it to be successful, you have to have a buy-in. And we have great give partners with probation, the district attorney's office, um, the sheriff's office, parole, and we all have an open line of communication. But that's on an upper level. You know, if, if you're not trickling that information down or that, or you have people in patrol that are not privy to these meetings or that don't even know that they go on, then they're just looking at dots on a map and they're not seeing the personal connection. They're not seeing the intelligence that's showing you why or who. So it's really for us to, I think, you know, to, to become or to continue to be successful, um, you know, because obviously we don't want to go back to 55 shootings. Mm -hmm. 15 is, well actually, we're at 60 now because we have another day, but we don't want to go back up to 55. So we need to not panic, 
you know, as an agency, you need to just look at who your group members are and what you can do in your organization to try to filter this information down. And now we have, you know, our patrol lieutenant, our narcotics detective sergeant, they were never really looped into the give, into the give meetings before, and now they're there, and now they're starting to get a real good working knowledge of why we do what we do, what the maps mean, what else we can learn from these give meetings, and what our partners have to offer. Mm. So it's, it's, been, it's been great for us. Because hotspot policing has to go beyond dots on the map. It's got to include intel information, as I said, so we can learn the story behind the dots. You have to understand how the dots got there. Um, every Monday we sit down with a crime analyst, the field intel detective, myself, and our, our close give partners from the DA's office, from probation, and we put our heads together and say, look, we had a shooting at this location, or there was, you know, one of our group members was involved in, a, in, in something that was gun related. It might not be a bullet to body. It might be he was found with a bullet in his pocket, but something as little as that, you know, it, it starts, it still shows up on the map, and it still gives us a good idea of, okay, well, you know, maybe we need to talk to this guy. And probation may say, well, he's coming in next week. So if he's coming in anyway, we're going to sit down and talk to them. Yeah. But, you know, in addition to institutionalizing it in your agency and making sure that you have buy-in from the top all the way down to the newest police officer that you have, um, that's number one. And then number two is having good partners that you can communicate with, that you can share intel with, that you can get intel from. Um, that's, I think, why we've had this success, and that's why although all the red that we're seeing for this year is, you know, it, it's a little upsetting because we had such a great year where we were down to eight shootings. Um, we just, you can't panic and you have to know that this is cyclical and you have to really trust the process and, and trust that, you know, the data and the research will put you in the right direction. You just have to have kind of some, some faith in the system, so to speak. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Joe. Um, let me just say, if, if you have a question, please make your way to the microphones on the side. We'd really appreciate if, if some of you have a burning question. It's OK. This is classroom style, I know, of 500 people. But uh, please feel free to ask. As folks are hopefully making their way up to the microphones, Joe, I want to just start with you and, and a follow-up question. Um, and, and really, this gets to many of the presentations. But you know, part of this place-based approach at very specific places is about coordination, um, in particular coordination of patrol and specialized units, and detectives, uh, frankly. Um, can you give us a, a little more specific? It, it may not even be happening in Newburgh, because this is a tough, this is hard to do. Um, but you know what? What's your vision of that? So, you know, if you if you could have anything you wanted, and what's your vision of like that coordination between patrol and specialized units to actually achieve some of the things that you're doing or that you're trying to accomplish? So I, I think that I would like to see more involvement from our first line supervisors in patrol and some more buy in.
Uh, Chris, do you, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, th yeah, there are a lot of important coordination uh, issues just in general that you think about uh, for a police department and doing it well, starting with the crime analysis unit and getting that information out regularly to patrol, making sure supervisors are aware of the hot spots and tracking the activities that go on there. Uh, and yes, when you can try tie in special units as well, that brings additional additional layer of complexity of, um, of something that you want to try to coordinate. and. Uh, so yeah, there has to be, in some respects, kind of a master plan that yes. the agency has to be entirely on board with the fact that these are priority locations and anything that's going on here, we want to have some record of that and some and be conscious of what we're doing. Yeah, I, I think um, oftentimes we tend to record um, crime. I think police record crime very well. Uh, they also now report, record complaints very well. But one, th and they record investigations very well, right? But oftentimes these proactive tactics, these proactive activities that you all are doing constantly, uh, we rarely have an understanding or a history of them. And I think that could be really helpful in terms of, in terms of building on that. Uh, Claire, just a question about co-responders. Mm -hmm. I was hoping you can get into more specifics about this. Uh, we have very, um, it's small, but growing research now on, uh, first of all, mental health, uh, folks in mental health crisis calls concentrate geographically. We now have uh, research that shows that. And we have some evaluation on co-response models, right? What does that actually look like um, in terms of, you know, agencies in, in other places that are implementing co-response models. Like, what, what, how does that actually happen? How can agencies yeah. out here understand that better? So a lot of it is also going to depend on, quote unquote, a mental health system as well. And so some um, areas or cities that may not be as established as well as others. Uh, when what we did is we partnered with a uh, the Baltimore Baltimore Crisis Response um, uh, Incorporated, and they already had community crisis response. They had uh, beds for detox, so they had the residential side of, mm -hmm. of mental health treatment. Mm -hmm. And what it really did was allow, so those partnerships that um, police officers and mental health clinicians have very complementary skills. They worked very well together. So we, we partnered with an agency that had people, go, uh, mental health professionals that were comfortable going out into the community because um, these were high crime areas. And, and then you had the, the law enforcement side that in these areas they wanted as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we you'd go back and forth and maybe just send clinicians to these places. Um, but you need that law enforcement aspect as well. So having that partnership, um, whether that's in-house, I've seen some agencies are bringing on clinicians into the, the, the um, department mm -hmm. that then can respond. Um, but it's when still a, very when a responsive. call comes out, yeah. So it's still mm -hmm. highly reactive. Most most co-responder models are reactive. A crisis occurs, they go to the crisis. The mental health clinician is able to de-escalate, have some of these additional skills, um, and then they may follow up with that individual. But still, it's individual focused. Mm -hmm. uh, it can also be um, so if you have that in house, or just establishing those networks with service providers so that you can streamline the process. Mm -hmm. So getting, I mean, healthcare, right, it's a mess. Trying to navigate the healthcare system is a mess. And if you can have someone that knows how to navigate that system, knows what type of resources you have and need, if you have healthcare or you don't, which places you can go, um, so that if you get someone on the street who is a heroin addict and they are, in that moment, they're ready. They're ready to go, you know, they're, they're like, I wanna stop, I've hit rock bottom. You have a bed ready for them that you can take them right there. You don't have to go through, well, we'll come back and we'll do, cause then they're gone, right? Or that moment is gone. Yeah. Um, so having that clinician, and that's where we, we advocate kind of that proactive hotspot approach. If you're, the police are going there, why not bring a clinician with you? Mm -hmm. So that when those moments arise, um, if there's family members involved, you can work on how to talk with the family member if a crisis does occur, uh, what the family member needs to tell dispatch mm -hmm. so that they know how to get the right people to respond. Yeah. 
And I guess you also need some history within dispatch about repeat response. Yeah. So CIT, uh, the crisis intervention teams, uh, a key component of that is training your dispatchers as well. Mm -hmm. So they should go through a CIT training along with the police officers. Uh, CIT is just giving the officers more training, not necessarily partnering with the clinician. Mm -hmm. The co-responder model is that clinician and police officer. But ev even if either one of those, you want your dispatch to know what medica you know, ask questions about what are the symptoms, what medications are they not taking that they should be taking, because those send into signals of what type of mental health issue you're up against, what type of resources you may need. Thank you. Um, I have one more question, but I, I, I don't know if anybody has a burning question. I know it's a big room, but <laughs> it's okay. Just shout it out, uh, your question, if you do have one, if anybody wants to ask. I know, I know it's, it's like tough. Like my classrooms. Yeah, it's <laughs> tough the first week, but um, the first session. Um, <laughs> But my final question to all three of you is maybe you can give the audience some very real uh, understanding of the opportunity structures that are contributing to problems at these places. So what I mean by this is, Joe, you were talking about the streets and blocking them off. And, and maybe you could just think of a, a few things you could leave the audience with that they could be looking for at these places. Um, Chris, do you wanna, do you wanna start? Sure. Well, one thing that uh, police do very commonly when addressing hotspots in a, a problem-oriented policing framework is they often start with basic situational crime prevention measures. So they look for things like, you know, bad lighting or spots of blocked visibility, uh, an abandoned building, things like that that might be causing problems. And that <clears throat> the research suggests that those uh, situational crime prevention measures are themselves uh, effective things to put in place at hotspots, and you can use that's some of the low-hanging fruit, I guess, so to speak, a, a good starting place uh, with hotspots and problem solving. Yeah, I, I feel like um, SEPTED has gone sometimes out of fashion, but it's like such a base, SEPTED, crime prevention through environmental design, it's such a basic, important component of place-based approaches. Claire, anything to add? Um, you know, mine, I would say talk to the people on the street. So when you take those 10, 15 minute stops in a crime hotspot, yeah. talk to the individuals living there, talk to the people um, that are passing through to understand what type of social environment that is. When we talk about opportunity structures, if a community is not engaged, if the people who live on that street are not engaged and not willing to call the police, um, that provides opportunity for crimes. And so having that, and we know we're starting to learn that the police can help a community build that trust among themselves so that they are an active partner. I, th I think sometimes we, um, at least when I was in patrol, you don't often, you, you observe in certain ways, but uh, the observations of officers are not as focused sometimes on individuals in those hotspots or, Chris, on, mm -hmm. on situations that might be causing those issues. Mm -hmm. Joe, you have the last word. So, no perfect. pressure. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> uh, so, I think if you look at the geography of like where your problem areas are, uh, for an example, in Newburgh we had a, an alleyway that connected two streets that were both problem areas and we had DPW come and it took them a while and it took them a lot of convincing but they came and they cleaned out this, this alleyway, right, because we would, get, we would go in foot pursuits with guys through there and we'd lose them and it was, it was unsafe for us, it was unsafe for them. You had drug users back there, you had you know, homeless people back there, but now that's a clean path. Um, on that one of those same, you know, one block up, we have all the lighting replaced with LED lighting. Uh, we've had codes go through and, and do code enforcement. Um, you have to start looking at all the resources that you have in your jurisdiction. And you know, for narcotic search warrants, we would, we'll bring code enforcement with us or call codes, codes out afterwards to try to do a, an order of condemnation. So, I mean, I think these are the things that you kind of want to start. We have to start being creative, right? Because like the same old thing is just not working, right? Our hotspots are still our hotspots. The faces may change, but you're still having a problem with crime in a specific area. So you really need to look at what other things you can do. I mean, in, we also, we changed a one-way directionally. So we had a one-way, 
that went north to south and now it goes south to north. So just to kind of offset some of the drug traffic. Hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you all of you for your attention. I, I think um, if we could give the panel a round of applause for their <laughs> presentation. And again, before we take a break, I just really encourage all of you to take advantage of the other speakers. You know, it, it, feel free to ask questions in the smaller sessions because that's what we're here for. Thanks. Thank you, Chuck. Great. Thank you, Cynthia, and the rest of the panelists. We appreciate it.